Bad diets, the good, the bad, and the really ugly. Hi, my name is Libby Parker. I'm a registered dietitian here to debunk common fad diets by looking at evidence-based scientific research and their lifestyle implications. Today we're digging into the popular eat right for your blood type diet. Stay tuned. For your type diet developed by naturopathic physician Peter Diadamo claims that you will lose weight and have more energy once you eliminate toxic foods from your diet. The premise of this diet is that our different blood types chemically react differently with foods and that certain foods have better or worse reactions with each blood type, causing sickness, weight gain, and other issues. To follow this diet, you need to know your blood type, O, A, B, or AB. Based on your blood type, there are very specific diets that don't allow for personal preference. These blood type specific diets are wildly different from very meat heavy type O's and vegetarian for type A's and make exercise recommendations based on blood type as well, such as gentle yoga and tai chi for one type and vigorous cardio for another type. What's good about this diet? Well, he does state that a one size fits all approach to nutrition does not work, which I do agree with. The good part of this diet is that there seems to be no caloric restriction, though he does go on to promote his own line of supplements and some expensive organic foods. One study showed that health markers improved for people on the type A diet, which is vegetarian, even those with other blood types, proving that this is not specific to a certain blood type. All right, the bad? Well, to start, this diet has no scientific backing. More on that in a minute. But even if you did follow it, there's no wiggle room for personal preference, even in spices and condiments. The fact that fear-based terms like toxic foods are used as a marketing gimmick is neither true nor helpful and seems to be the main tactic of naturopaths. His website, and I assume book, which admittedly I have not read, use big words like agglutinating, which I don't know anyone that would understand. It means to clump together, so why wouldn't he just say that for his target market, whom are probably not scholars and scientists if they're following his diet? He follows up with comparing lectin molecules to suction cups. Hey. Okay. Uh, my own personal aside, each blood type also has positive and negative types, which he doesn't seem to have opinion on how that affects food reactions. So to him, are A negatives and A positives the same chemically? The research parts of the site are parts exerted from Alternative Medicine Digest from Future Medicine Publishing, which is not a credible source. So here are some of the details of the diet. Cutting out lectins. So lectins, by definition, are any of a class of proteins, chiefly of plant origin, that bind specifically to certain sugars and so cause agglutination or clumping of particular cell types. Lectins are in about 30% of foods, and that would make it difficult to cut out. Not only that, but they're in healthy foods such as beans and legumes, tomato, avocado, potatoes, wheat, mushrooms, eggs, asparagus, and more. The website claims that fortunately most lectins found in the diet are not quite so life-threatening, although they can cause a variety of other problems, especially if they're specific to a particular blood type. For the most part, our immune system protects us from lectins, and 95% of the lectins we absorb from typical diets are sloughed off by the body. But at least 5% of the lectins we eat are filtered into the bloodstream, where they react with and destroy red and white blood cells. The actions of lectins on the digestive tract can be even more powerful. They often create a violent inflammation of sensitive mucus of the intestines, and the agglutination action may mimic food allergies. Even a minute quantity of lectin is capable of agglutinating a huge number of cells if the particular blood type is reactive. As a registered dietitian, I don't remember learning anything about lectins in school. They were not discussed in the eight years of higher education that I had. And as accredited programs from the Commission on Dietetic Registration, I have to believe that if lectins were really worrisome or harmful, we would have learned about them and how to educate people to not eat them. Instead, our whole program educates us to tell people to eat these foods. Why? Because they're generally known as healthy foods. Additional research on my own proves the same. 
Okay, so the really ugly? Well, WebMD makes a good point that this diet only takes into account the blood type and ignores other things such as chronic conditions like diabetes, which requires a very diet-based treatment. This can make conditions way worse. So it also goes against some other general recommendations for everyone's health, including the exercise recommendations. So the frequently asked questions section of the website has some hilarious and some likely harmful claims. I want to share a few of my favorites. Okay, question. Can kelp be substituted for bladder rack? Answer. No. Be sure the bottle says fucus vesculosis. What the heck is bladder rack or fucus vesculosis, if I'm even saying that right? Well, some research I did shows that it's a type of seaweed, but I've never heard of eating that particular one. Another question. Based on the information I've read in the Eat Right for Your Type, red meat should be consumed three to four times a week by type O's. I'm concerned with mad cow disease. Well, to his credit, Diamos says that this is very low risk and cites the CDC. Okay, another frequently asked question. I can do the program for a while, but then I feel that my will begins to slip and I'm binging again. His answer? The trick to surviving failure is to refuse to be disillusioned by it. It is the gradual effects of disillusionment, retreat after defeat, that sap the will and prevent us from enduring to the end in order to triumph over our challenges. The first step in the process, don't degrade your failures by stripping them of their spiritual value. What? That doesn't answer the question. And willpower, willpower and faith doesn't work. That's why diets fail. All right, the downright infuriating question. What if I don't respond? His answer? The key is to realize that if you're not getting healthier, then you should accept responsibility and be willing to change something about your lifestyle to continue the facilitation of your healing. Seriously, dude. Okay. What does the peer-reviewed literature state? Well, a search in PubMed gave a clear answer through several articles. Here are some of their concluding statements. Findings do not support the blood type diet hypothesis. No evidence currently exists to validate the perpetrated health benefits of blood type diets. Blood type fad diet theory fails a test. In the end, the researchers could show no evidence that sticking to one's blood type diet was associated with better health. Of course, the lack of proof for a link doesn't prove that there isn't one, but it certainly didn't show up in this study. Fad diets are intriguing to many people, but not really necessary. High quality science has always identified the healthiest ways of eating. Start with plenty of fruits and vegetables every day, with moderate portions of whole grains and low fat dairy, and limited amounts of red and processed meat. ABO genotype does not modify any association between blood type diets and biomarkers of cardiometabolic disease in overweight adults, suggesting that the theory behind this diet is not valid. ABO has also become a research subject in neurobiology and the preparation of artificial universal blood and became a topic of pseudoscience of blood type diets. ABO has also become a topic of pseudoscience. In his book, Eat Right for Your Type, D. Adiamo claimed that the human ABO blood type is the most important factor in determining a healthy diet. He proposed distinctive diets for individuals with different ABO groups. He reasoned that the reactions to lectins present in food depend on the ABO group of the individual and that the food containing incompatible and harmful lectins would better be avoided to minimize the toxic reactions caused by lectin AB antigen interactions. No data were presented that correlated the kinds of lectins present in the diets and their ABO specificity. Actually, lectins possessing a high affinity to a particular ABO group are uncommon in food except for some beans. See the Consortium for Functional Glycomics database. It is difficult to propose blood type diets without knowing which lectins are contained or absent in which foods. Therefore, the promotion of these diets is wrong. It may potentially harm people by suggesting diets omitting foods of nutrient value because of his mistaken assignments. In addition, his contention that O, A, B, and A, B groups originated 30, 20, 10, and 1,000 years ago, respectively, 
does not fit with the current evolutionary theory of the ABO gene. The genetic change responsible for the O group in humans predates modern human and Neanderthal divergence. Overall, this diet is not based in science and may be harmful if the recommendations don't work for your conditions or lifestyle. I don't recommend it. Okay, so we covered the diet portion, but there was still one part I was not satisfied with. While researching the diet, I read that Dion Diamo was a naturopathic physician, which I hadn't really heard of before. So that led me down another rabbit hole of the internet looking up what that meant, and the results were pretty scary. So what's a naturopathic physician? The schooling is a four-year school for naturopathic medicine, which has courses in biology, chemistry, but also hydrotherapy, botany, homeopathy. Unlike medical doctors, they're not required to do residencies, only learn minor surgery, and need a supervising physician to oversee surgery and to prescribe. Essentially, naturopathic doctors work on fear-based quackery. A quote from a book I read as part of my graduate school curriculum went loosely like this. Alternative medicine is just that, alternative. If it was proven medicine, it wouldn't be called alternative. This closely mimics a quote from a Forbes article which states, most doctors accept that there is no alternative medicine. There's only medicine and everything else. Any alternative medicine that passes scientific muster is adopted and simply becomes medicine. Evidence-based science means something. This is also why medical nutrition therapy is different from most of the dietary advice given by non-nutrition professionals. Also from Forbes, typical naturopathic procedures that would be allowed in the state included long disproved quackery such as homeopathy, hydrotherapy, and electromagnetic therapy, none of which have a consistent definition, but as they are generally understood, make no scientific sense and have been tested and found to be useless or dangerous. The real problem, though, is that naturopaths are not real doctors. It's based on outdated ideas about human health. Their official statements try to set them apart from other doctors by claiming to work more naturally, whatever that may mean. Not just medical doctors think this. Confessions of a former naturopathic doctor, Britt Hermes, states, It took years before she realized that naturopathy was a sham. It's not based in science, even if it feels like it, and even if practitioners are falsely taught to believe they're helping patients. Prior to this seminal moment, I was skilled at ignoring information that I did not agree with. Today, I can no longer disregard the inconvenient fact that I was a quack. In her blog, she states, there is no such thing as a deep detox. The entire concept of detoxification in alternative medicine is bogus. There's absolutely no health benefits to be gained from detoxification of diets or therapies. Our organs do not need a break from their physiological activities. Drinking special shakes or taking certain herbal supplements is not going to help any organ work better or more efficiently. Our body doesn't need to be supported with mega doses of vitamins and minerals. We don't need enemas or laxatives to clean out our colons. Needless to say, the detox is not based on any kind of credible scientific evidence. Now, as my viewers know, I'm not a fan of the paleo diet as a strict plan. The former ND has something to say about this as well. I recently had a flare-up of psoriasis after some time being free of plaques. I mentioned to a colleague that I wanted to get a little extra sleep to help with the stress. He suggested that I begin eating a paleo diet. Well, well meaning, this advice is not supported by evidence and could be emotionally dangerous. For years, I bought into the idea that I could achieve perfect health by controlling my diet and my immediate environment. When flares occurred, or when I got sick, I blamed myself for not eating right or not trying hard enough. Naturopathic students were told over and over in school to walk the walk of our medicine. We needed to embody healthfulness. If we looked ill or were overweight, patients would not take us seriously. I took this to heart. I wanted to exude well-being. I subjected myself to numerous detoxes and naturopathic therapies in the name of healing myself. When those therapies failed, as they do, I added more treatments to my regimen. Instead of becoming healthy though, I made myself physically and emotionally sicker than I had ever been. I developed an eating disorder. My period stopped, my hair fell out, my autoimmune systems worsened. Naturopaths are selling lies. Detoxes do not empower patients or provide them with tools to take charge of their health. The detoxification fad depends on patient guilt. 
If the patient doesn't invest in completing the detox, it's her fault that she's sick. If she does complete the detox but still doesn't get better, then the patient needs to do more detoxing. Brit's blog is one of the treasures I found in my research for this video. I linked it and other sources in the description below this video. My final thoughts on all of this are to always, always do your research, know what legitimate sources are, and never be afraid to second guess or get a second opinion. Especially when it comes to food, everyone has an opinion, but facts do not cease to exist just because they're ignored. Be your own health advocate. In an upcoming video, I'm going to go over how to look critically at research and find if there's any substantiating evidence behind the health information you're reading. Make sure to subscribe to this channel by clicking the subscribe button below to be informed when this video is released. If you find these videos helpful, please share them with a friend or on your social media feed. I'll see you next time.